Final Doom is a weird product. Released in 1996, the game was just more Doom, which isn't bad at all, but this came out in the same year as Duke Nukem 3D and Quake. The game didn't feature any new weapons or enemy types, and from a technical standpoint, there wasn't much on offer compared to other contemporary shooter games. Final Doom and its two megawads, the Plutonia Experiment and TNT Evolution, came and went. Over the years, TNT and Plutonia have received an interesting reception. Plutonia is often praised for its innovative yet consistent level design and its punishing difficulty, but I've also seen a ton of people take issue with the latter. On the other side of the coin, TNT has been both celebrated by Doom fans as well as ridiculed. Final Doom has split the community ever since its release in 1996, and there's no overwhelming consensus. I am in the same boat of people who are mixed on TNT and Plutonia, since as a whole, there are incredible moments, as well as shitty moments that taint the overall Final Doom product. With that said, I think it's best to go through both megawads and pick out sections that I enjoy and absolutely fucking hate. Oh, and just to get this out of the way, TNT and Plutonia are hard as fuck, and will test most Doom players. In 1995, Team TNT started work on a new megawad for Doom 2, named the New Technology, Evolution, or simply TNT Evolution. This group of WAD makers were going to release this level set online for free, but id Software snatched up the game last minute and made it a commercial product as the first half of Final Doom. Team TNT released a press statement on the 27th of October about the news, and rightfully so, this pissed off a ton of people. They were going to release TNT Evolution for free, but it had been bought out by id. That's like if I made a Super Mario Bros. mod, and when I'm just about to release it free of charge, like literally the day of, Nintendo tosses me some money and puts it out commercially. The distribution of TNT Evolution is very weird, and even though it's not a big deal now obviously, it's pretty ridiculous that id Software did that to begin with. Two members of Team TNT, brothers Dario and Milo Casali, were hired to do a separate megawad for Final Doom, and that ended up being the Plutonia Experiments. If I ever started a band, I would want to name it Plutonia. It's such a fucking awesome word. Out of the 32 maps in Plutonia, they split the work equally and designed 16 levels each. The recommended order for playing Final Doom is that you start off with TNT and then graduate to playing the Plutonia experiments. The reason being is that Plutonia is much harder than TNT Evolution, and while TNT is more difficult than Doom 2 for instance, it's still pretty fair for the most part. I will touch on Plutonia more later on, but for right now, we need to examine TNT's levels. To put it simply, TNT Evolution is a mixed bag. When TNT is good, it's really good, and the game has higher highs than Doom 2. At the same time, it also has lower lows, as most of the bad levels are downright terrible. When a map is poorly designed in TNT, it sticks out like a sore thumb and downgrades the overall experience by a huge margin for me. However, when the game is at its best, with maps like Pharaoh, Caribbean, Wormhole, Heck, or Stronghold to name a few, TNT becomes like the best iWOD to play. Unfortunately, there is more often than not mediocre map design plaguing TNT, and it's a real shame because most of these map creators have gone on to do amazing work. The only designer that has a perfect record on TNT is Dario Casali, who made the two secret maps, Pharaoh and Caribbean. That is if you discount his work on map 18, Mill, as that level is one of my lesser favourites. Mill is way too big for its 
own good, and you end up running about the place so much that it becomes unbearable. Now backtracking is normal in Doom, and oftentimes it can be quite fun searching for new areas in places you've already been, but map 18 goes overboard with that. For all its mishaps and shitty design choices, TNT at least starts out decent enough. I mean, the Berserk power-up is accessible right out of the gate in the first level, and that's amazing. Pro tip for any map makers out there, putting a Berserk in map 1 will always put a smile on the player's face. TNT's first level reminds me a ton of Entryway, and it's a perfectly good map to start out the Megawad. Human Barbecue, Power Control, and Wormhole are up next, and they are all quality maps. So far, there are no issues with TNT, and the difficulty is very steady, with it being harder than Doom 2, but the game still keeps things fair. I mentioned earlier that Wormhole is a personal highlight, and it took me a couple of replays to fully appreciate that map. This level attempts to have a mirror dimension where you play through the same section again, but things are altered, and I love that. If you hop through this teleporter, you end up in a much more difficult version of the same map layout. That's an amazing idea, and this map is fantastic, with the only blemish being that the level exit switch is on the easier section, so people can totally bypass what makes this map so unique. TNT keeps up a good level of quality until map 7, Prison. This stage is way too big, and that criticism is one of my fundamental issues with the entire Megawad. TNT has quite a few maps that stretch so far and are so open-ended for no fucking reason. For instance, map 8, Metal, has multiple large arenas with hitscan enemies included, and they don't feel designed with any rhyme or reason. There are also maps that feel like an endurance to finish due to their size, and after a while they start to become fucking unbearable. Central Processing, Mount Pain, Baron's Den, and Administration Center are my go-to examples. At least with Mount Pain, I can tell that the designers were playing into the whole endurance idea, and the map being an endurance for players to finish was their intention. I think Mount Pain works in that case, considering that it's one of the final levels of the game. The lack of health pickups and hitscan enemies that can drain your life in a single blast also help enforce that fight for survival element of the map. I generally like Mount Pain, even though the map design itself is nothing too special. However, the other maps I mentioned before feel long and open-ended just for the sake of it. Just because you can make a gigantic map with sprawling combat zones, it doesn't mean you should or that it would add to your level in any way. That is one of TNT's fatal design flaws, and after a couple of these large levels, you get sick of it. Luckily, there are some palette cleanser maps in TNT that are way more focused. One of my favourites of these that doesn't really get a lot of shine is Map 23, Lunar Mining Project. It's a very short and sweet map that doesn't overstay its welcome. Team TNT wanted to really nail the realistic environment aesthetic with TNT Evolution, and I think Map 23 is the ultimate representation of this. There are sleeping quarters with armour in the wardrobe, I love it. There is an office space with computer monitors and a bookshelf inside, and there's also a mineshaft you have to go down to grab one of the keys. Even though we don't have space mining colonies in real life, this is the perfect Doom rendition of one, and it's great. Anyway, when you finish map 8, Metal, you get to play another TNT highlight with Stronghold. This level is just an onslaught of demons, and you get to fuck up each and every one of them. You're not really trying to survive the monsters, it feels more like a bloodbath than anything else. Map 9's premise is simple and it's great. Unfortunately, TNT dips in quality after this, and apart from a handful of levels, the Megawad becomes pretty mediocre. From map 10 to the very last level in TNT Evolution, I only really enjoy Deepest Reaches, Shipping Slash Respawning, Lunar Mining Project, Mount Pain, Heck, Last Call, Pharaoh, and Caribbean. The rest of the maps are either okay with some glaring issues, bland and not really worth replaying, or simply bad. 
The maps that I pointed out as my favourites are really good in my eyes, or they have some quirk or interesting quality that makes them stand out. My overall reaction with TNT Evolution is that the highs are really high, the lows are really low, and then the world is also loaded with maps that are very throwaway. TNT is quite spotty, with maps going up and down and up again in quality, so that leaves TNT being pretty decent. Not perfect, but when the maps work, the game is extremely enjoyable. An example of a throwaway map is with map 11, Storage Facility. The thing is, map 19, shipping slash respawning, is just a better version of map 11's general idea of a level being located in a storage containment factory. I'm not sure why we needed both maps included, even though they give off the same exact feeling, but whatever. At the time of making this video, I do prefer TNT Evolution to Doom 2, because the best maps in TNT eclipse the best from Doom 2, probably except for the living end. I mean, just to make my point, Map 28, Heck, is basically a refined take on Tricks and Traps from Doom 2. Designed by Milo Casali, Heck presents a selection of rooms that the player needs to navigate to grab each key to open the level exit door. Each room presents its own unique challenge, and the pace of the map is brilliant. There's only a couple of doors to pick from to ensure that everything doesn't feel similar. All of the demon encounters are great, and Map 28 might be my favourite level from TNT Evolution actually. I didn't really know where to put this in the video, but I need to talk about Habitat for a moment. I guess it's fitting that after I talk about my favourite map in TNT Evolution, I then examine what is dubbed the worst map in the game. Map 22, Habitat, is without a doubt one of the most infamous levels in Doom history, and there's a couple of reasons for that. For one, Habitat is considered really ugly, and I can't say that I disagree. When we first load up the map, we can see this putrid combination of toxic waste and a water stream. It just looks amateurish, and the inclusion of these brown pillars and gross wall textures makes this even worse. I mean look at this, would you like to play this? Anyway, as we continue on with the map, we come across a grassy open field with an arch vial ready to fuck you up if you aren't already prepared. This area might be the best looking section of the entire level, but that's not really saying much. If you run past this fake wall, you are able to grab the blue key, something that is not required in the slightest to beat the map. In fact, if you just run over here, open up this door, and run some more, you'll be at the exit. This is fucking mind-blowing. How can they fuck up a level this bad? Even if you do explore the rest of the map, specifically the underground tunnel section, it's not fun to in my opinion. This part is confusing, not enjoyable to navigate, and you're harassed by hit scanners and pinky demons. I recommend just grabbing the BFG secrets and gunning for the exits. Habitat is a load of fuck, and as I've already mentioned, the level after, Map 23, Lunar Mining Project, is way more entertaining and visually interesting. Before we wrap up TNT with Map 30, I wanted to vomit out my appreciation for the two secret maps again. I think there are various maps in TNT that try and give the player a tense feeling, but fail in doing so. Maps 31 and 32 succeed. Whenever I play both of these maps, I actually feel concerned about my next move and what the map would throw at me next. I do prefer Faro out of the two secret maps, and a big part of why is due to the atmosphere. The music, the textures, and the way that the map is laid out works so well to me, and I can't get enough of it. I know Caribbean has more enemy encounters and that Faro might feel a bit empty for some people, but that's part of its charm. I love walking through this massive deserted pyramid and the Egyptian landscape, trying to figure out what puzzle I need to solve next. That being said, there are still plenty of challenging demon battles in the level, but if you're not a fan of Pharaoh's slower pace, then you can just cheese it to Caribbean.
TNT rounds off with map 30, Last Call, which is a solid Icon of Sin map. Many players are turned off at the start with the Torch platform puzzle, where you have to follow the correct path and if you make one wrong step, the game kills you. I understand people's frustration with this beginning puzzle, as the final map should be testing your acquired combat skills and not your mind, but there's actually a way to solve it in game without the use of a guide. The torches in the opening room signify the order of the platforms you need to hop on, and that's pretty clever. If we carry on with the map, there are a couple of more demon encounters that aren't that difficult, and sooner or later we got up to the final arena with the Icon of Sin. Instead of riding a lift to shoot rockets into his brain at a very specific time like in Doom 2, you only need to sit on the second highest step on the staircase, fire at him, and that's it. I think TNT has the strongest map 30 compared to Doom 2 and Plutonia, but it's too bad that the game as a whole is so jumbled in quality. The Plutonia experiment was made in only a few months by the Casali brothers, but they churned out a pretty amazing product. If you play Doom a bit more casually, or maybe you usually play it on a lower difficulty setting, then Plutonia might not be your favourite game. This megawad is intended for experienced Doom players, and if you aren't careful, Plutonia's maps will fuck you up. Dario and Milo Casali split up the work between them and you can see the effort put in. Apart from the original Doom, the Plutonia experiment might be the most consistent game out of the four iWads. I believe that the first two thirds of Plutonia are more or less great, but then the level of quality starts to drop at around map 20, and only really picks up again when we get into map 29, Odyssey of Noises. Instead of being all over the place like Team T, the Plutonia experiment is brilliant with few exceptions for around 20 maps, and after that, the game runs out of steam. The Death Domain, Impossible Mission, Tombstone, The Final Frontier, The Temple of Darkness, Bunker, Antichrist, and The Sewers, so basically maps 20 to 28, are either painfully mediocre or just poor. That being said, I want to focus on the good aspects of Plutonia, because there is a lot to like. Many levels feel like a combat puzzle that the player needs to solve, and while people have used the puzzle analogy for other Doom games, I feel like it's most relevant with Plutonia. I always find myself checking where the exit is, predicting if it'll get blocked off, thinking about what weapon I should use to fight off the incoming enemies, and whether I should circle strafe like crazy, or use cover. I love how much Plutonia makes the player think about their decisions, and while you do think in other classic Doom games, Plutonia takes this idea to the next level. The Casali brothers really knew what they were doing when it came to designing maps, and where to place the enemies so that they would bring out the most challenge. For instance, arch vials are sometimes paired with chain gunners, so you have a constant stream of bullets firing at you. Pain elementals are used more as distractions in order for higher tier monsters to hit you easier. Oh, and I forgot to mention how revenants are almost featured in Plutonia more than imps. Yeah, Plutonia is really um, it's it, it really holds up. It's very um, it's very fun to play, and it's 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 um, Thank you. probably one of the most difficult um map sets that are like official id software products and um like they're i think yeah i hear that's a lot yeah <laughs> there was lot. um yeah on a scale of one to ten how much do you like revenants <laughs> <laughs> well see they're so they're so useful as a gameplay tool because you can put them in the mid distance and it's really tough you have to bring out your rocket launcher because you you, you can't really shoot them at distance with much else yeah. And then if you bring your rocket launcher out, you better not have any um, demons or anything in the, in the near ground. You're going to blow yourself up. So they are really useful. An yes. Area of denial of large areas. So yeah, we we love those guys. And you know, we make them. We made the maps really hard because we played so much that we wanted something that was going to be a challenge. Because we'd play maps and we'd just kind of zombie our way through them mm. uh, without really breaking a sweat. And we really wanted to break a sweat, so we kept that. That's the kind of experience we were going for. Uh, and then Milo did the insane um, secret level, go to it. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, and I thought, what the hell are you doing? This is ridiculous. <laughs> and, and that ended up being, okay, so that's the only way we can break a sweat now is these ridiculous uh, maps with massive numbers of monsters in them. So yeah, the enemy placement in Plutonia's maps can be fucking frustrating, but that's kind of the point. I also want to praise the level exit portal that the Casale brothers made for Plutonia. To put it simply, it's a very cool design, and when you step onto one to finish the level, it's the best feeling in the world. Speaking of the maps themselves, the game starts strong with the first 11 levels, with my only real exception being map 3. Aztec. Getting the blue key in that map can be pretty fucking annoying, and I don't think the gameplay on offer in Aztec is that engaging. Apart from that small blemish, maps 1 to 11 are very good, with my personal favourites out of those being Abattoir, Ghost Town, and Courtyard. I mentioned that the first 11 maps in Plutonia are fantastic, as when we get into map 12, Speed, there's a bump in the road. While it's not terribly designed, it feels too dragged out for its own good, and I don't enjoy this level as much as the previous ones. The two maps after map 12, titled The Crypt and Genesis, are fun but deadly. In map 13, The Crypt specifically, the arch vials that the player needs to fight would definitely fuck you up if you're not paying attention. The arch vials attacks aren't exactly a problem at first, but when they also respawn the hordes of enemies that you killed in this open area and basically use them as shields so you can't kill the arch vials, that's where the issue lies. This is a brilliant trap, as it perfectly understands the monster's capabilities and how they can challenge the player when they are all grouped together. Map 14, Genesis is after this, and it's a very fun experience. The game takes another dip in quality with Map 15, The Twilight, mostly due to the level's annoying design. There's an overabundance of monsters, and while that's not inherently a bad thing, all of them chipping off your health at once can get a little too frustrating. I'm just not really a fan of this map, but at least it's short and there's multiple ways to end the level with the normal and secret exits. The few set of maps following the Twilight might be my favourites in Plutonia. Map 16, The Omen, has extremely tight and enjoyable gameplay, and while it isn't the nicest looking level, it gets straight to the point and has some solid combat encounters. The section with the teleporting revenants is so much fun to deal with, as well as the monster barrage near the red key location. This ending part with the group of hit scanners on these platforms demonstrates the creativity of Plutonia. As you can see with the footage, I'm trying out different weapon combinations to quote, solve the puzzle, for lack of a better term. After I attempt to clear the room with two BFG shots, I go on to use the rocket launcher, chain gun, and shotgun because I might desperately need the BFG for an arch fire or something later on in the game. That's what I'm saying with Plutonia. It makes you think about the rooms and even levels ahead, and I don't really think about that much when playing other classic Doom games. Map 17, Compound, is next, and it's another fun level that the player can more or less breeze through. This map is a welcome change of pace, as the difficulty is not that absurd compared to the rest of Plutonia. As pointed out by many people already, Map 18 Neurosphere shares the same sort of design as the inmost ends from Doom 2. This map grabs your attention right off the bat with hit scanners immediately firing at you. Even though the beginning can be difficult to handle, Map 18 becomes easier as you go on and it's one of the highlights of the game. Map 19, Enemy is after this, and it includes a random cyber demon fight along with a couple of nasty traps. I love this level. And having said that, map 16 to 19, for me personally, is my favourite little phase of Plutonia. Maybe that's because after map 19, Plutonia's maps become either just okay or bad until Odyssey of Noises. Map 20, the Death Domain, is rather short in length, but the gameplay is all over the place. This map has fun and interesting set pieces, like the teleporting barons, and that's it. The rest I can do with that, and to me, Map 20 is the first bad map of Plutonia. Map 21, Slayer, is nothing special as well, but at least it doesn't drag on for too long. Unlike Map 22, Impossible Mission. 
This level is too big, and it feels like a slog when you're backtracking to flick switches and grab keys. Plus, the demon encounters aren't that inventive or engaging. For the majority of these later maps, Plutonia runs out of tricks, and they become too open and large for their own good. That statement rings especially true for map 23, Tombstone, which might be the worst map of the game. Most of the rooms in map 23 look identical, the enemy encounters are boring and the key collecting is not fun. Everything feels the same in Tombstone, and it's funny I said that when map 24 is around the corner, since that level is essentially a retread of the living end in Doom 2. Map 24, the final frontier, is fine, but there's nothing much else to say about it. The next level is also bland, with the only interesting design in map 25 being this little boat in the lava. Most of the levels after map 20 aren't terrible by any stretch, but Plutonia as a megawad loses steam and these maps become pretty unremarkable. That being said, map 26, Bunker, is bad in my eyes. But if you find mindlessly shooting demons in a long trench enjoyable, then you'll definitely get a kick out of it. Map 27, Antichrist, is Plutonia's second retread of Doom 2's The Living End level. Map 24 and map 27 share basically the same layout, and I think I prefer Antichrist, but the levels blend together too much in my mind to make a call on that. Map 28, the sewers is up next, and fuck, it's too drawn out, too wide open, too generic, and too tedious to talk about further. The only saving grace about Map 28 is that it brings us to one of the best maps in the Plutonia experiments. Odyssey of Noises. This level kicks so much ass, and it's how you should make a city map in Doom. There are proper landmarks that you can look at to get your bearings, there are snipers in the windows that are actually fun to fight, the level is rather difficult so you'll no doubt lose some health, which gives you an actual reason to explore each building, and on top of that, Odyssey of Noises is pleasant to look at. The entire map is visually interesting, specifically with how the green grass and brown buildings contrast heavily with the blood red sky and hellish pit below. I know that some people might not like this level due to its focus on exploration and picking off enemies one at a time, but I absolutely love it. This is proof that a drawn out plutonium map can be done right. This is also proof that a city map can be done right. After Odyssey of Noises is done, Plutonia wraps up with a rather standard yet entertaining Icon of Sin map. The timing required to hit the Icon of Sin is not as irritating as Doom 2, there's more build up to the fight this time around, and Plutonia throws in a Cyber Demon for good measure. Overall, Map 30, The Gateway of Hell, is an adequate final level that doesn't reinvent the wheel, but does a good job regardless. Now Plutonia's secret maps are notorious for being extremely tough on the player. Map 31, Cyber Den, holds up really well and I had a lot of fun with it. There's not too much to comment on with Cyber Den, it's just a solid secret map. Map 32 on the other hand is infamous for being the prototype of slaughter maps, and I'm not a huge fan of it. I know people love these kind of maps where you basically run out onto an open field and kill everything, but it's not exactly my cup of tea. So yeah. Final Doom is done, and the difficulty for both games can get insane. I have more clips of me dying and starting over in Final Doom than days I've been alive. But that aside, Final Doom is inconsistently good. TNT Evolution has some strong moments for sure, but its bad maps are just as prevalent. Even though the Plutonia experiment is mostly excellent, there is a long streak of subpar levels in the game's last third until map 29. However, the one thing that needs to not be discredited is the effort that the Casali brothers and Team TNT put into Final Doom. Team TNT had incredible map designers work on Evolution, and regardless of the Megawad's overall quality, all of these guys have put out other amazing work. On the other hand, Dario and Milo Casali are fucking wizards, and I'm not surprised in the slightest that they continue to have amazing careers in the video game industry to this day. I can't believe that the Casalis were about my age when they were approached to make Plutonia but I'm so glad they did. I prefer Plutonia as well as TNT Evolution over Doom 2, 
and for a couple of glorified fan-made megawads, that is impressive. 